Hello, my name is Chris Roberts, the host of The Long Road. I'm going to do a little bit different today. We, we really have two guests. Our first guest is, is Staff Sergeant Bernard E. J. Reed of the 157, uh, 157th Security Forces. Staff Sergeant Reed is now um, stationed in Iraq, and Staff Sergeant Reed played a major role in our next guest, which is going to be K-9 Patriot. Staff Sergeant Bernard Reed always had a lifetime, lifetime dream of becoming a police officer and working with police dogs. But he joined the United States Air Force, and like we said, he's on his second tour in Iraq. And so while being in Iraq, of course, he can't be a, a police officer, but he's still being a security policeman. Prior to going to Iraq, Staff Sergeant Reed decided to um, donate $5,000. He had heard about the Keen police dog retiring, and since he always wanted to work with police dogs, he decided, I want to donate $5,000 to the Keen police. The requirement was, well, he donated to New Hampshire Working Dogs um, Foundation. With the stipulation, he had two stipulations. The first stipulation was that the $5,000 had to go to Keen to, in a, to get a new police dog. The second stipulation by Staff Sergeant Reed was that the dog be named Patriot in honor of all the men and women who serve in uniform both in the United States and in Iraq and Afghanistan. <clears throat> and so unfortunately, Staff Sergeant Reed could not be here, but we wanted to ensure that Staff Sergeant Reed got the credit that he deserved. And you will see the K-9 Patriot, or Patriot as he's called, on-site training out by Otterbrook Dam at the State Police Dog Training Facility. Another thing that Staff Sergeant Reed has asked for, when he comes back for Iraq, he wants to be introduced to Patriot and the members of the Keene Police Force in honor and appreciating of what Staff Sergeant Reed has done will ensure there'll be a proper introduction between Staff Sergeant Reed and um, Patriot. Okay, for, for people who are keen, we've, some people have seen um, Patriot. He was introduced at the um, city council a number of months back. And um, <clears throat> Patriot, young dog, exciting dog, and he's going to make a welcome addition to the um, Keene Police Department. And I'm pretty sure that he won't be, he'll be an unwelcome um, addition to some of our scary characters who may not want to meet K-9 Patriot. But I'm pretty sure some of them will meet them, and some of them will go to the county farm or state prison. And so what we're going to do right now, we're going to actually meet K-9 Patriot. Hello, I'm here on location with um, Officer Denny. Tenny, yeah. Tenny, sorry, pronouncing that wrong. We're at the K-9 training facility. Mm -hmm. Is this both the Keen and the state police? Or? Yeah, uh, what this is, is the state police actually built it um, when they had... A couple years ago, they had two dogs in the area. Um, now they're down to two still, but they're up in Sullivan County. Um, so they, when they built this, they allowed us to use it here as well. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers gave them the property to use, and it works out good for us. So we have some localized areas we can use to do agility and obedience and stuff like that. So before we get on to the history of the dog and keen, I. You talked about the state police both being up in Sullivan County. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago when I read in the paper that the keen dog went down to Hinsdale for a break-in, so you've taken up some of the slack? Um, we've always kind of shared the slack, um, and we're going to kind of go into history. Uh, we've always had mutual aid with the other towns as well as the state police, and when Swansea had their dog, um, Mark Chamberlain and Argo, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we always support the other communities that don't have uh, dogs available to them. Um, and so, yeah, we do go out of town. Um, because they are primarily up in Sullivan County, we're usually the closest dog that's available. So we help out the other towns quite a bit, actually. And so as we get back, how long has Keene had a, a canine service? Uh, it was formally started in 1988 by Joe Collins. Um, he served with two dogs, uh, his first one being Max, and the second one that he had the longest was Canine Edar. Um, during that time frame, 
Bruce Bushy and his dog canine Ico came on board too. We actually had two dogs for a while. Um, Bruce and Ico were a drug detection team only, and Joe and Edar were uh, patrol. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, the differences between the two and what, what patrol dogs do. And, and, uh, and that's what we have now with, with myself and now Officer English and Canine Patriot. So um, we'll, we'll primarily cover the, the patrol aspect of it today. How long have you been in the canine service? Um, I've helped out since I got hired, which is in 1999. Um, then I got canine Leica in 2004. Uh, we replaced uh, Lieutenant Costa and his dog, canine Nico, when they retired. So. And um, <coughs> some people just don't understand the, the connection between the handler and the dog. That's a really close bond. It's an extreme bond. Um, we're with our dogs more than we're with anybody else. They go to work with us. They go home with us. They're, they're part of the family. Um, we, we really spend more time with them than we do our wives. Because uh, we're at work, we're at home. Uh, they're really just part of the family. I don't know if you like, your wife likes that comment. But <laughs> She's used to it. The, um, you're getting promoted, so congratulations are in order. Thank you. And we've always had dogs a, lot of time, a long time in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate part in, in the Marine Corps has changed now. A lot of times when the individual retired or left the service, they ended up putting the dog down. Right. What's going to happen to the dog now? Uh, canine Lake is going to retire. She's going to be part of my family. Um, I'll resume, or assume responsibility of her and, uh, and take her home, and, and she'll be my pet when she retires. And She's young enough. She, she's going to be eight when she retires. Uh, so she'll have a few good years of, of normal dog life ahead of her. Yeah. And um, right before we get to the, continue on with history, for some edification, the patrol dog is an actual police officer, correct? It, you, you could say that. Um, there's statutes that protect them against um, being assaulted or injured or even harassed when they're doing their, their job functions. Um, so there are some protections in place for the dog. Um, so you could say that they are considered a police officer. She, she doesn't wear it today because she usually bangs them all up. But we have a badge for the dogs that do go on their collars. And, um, and really over, over the working time, they're accepted by our, our co-workers because they help out so much. So you could, you could definitely say that. And over the course of history and around the country, police dogs have saved a lot of policemen's lives and other people's lives. Oh, yes. Whether it be... Um, going in first into a, you know, a dangerous situation or really what the most enjoying part is finding elderly people or, or lost children or, or people that are lost um, through the scent work is, is it's worth a million dollars. Well, we can call Officer English over here. He can't stay here all by himself. <laughs> and so we've got a new police dog. Yep. Is it Patriot? That's correct. How did Patriot come to the King Police Department? Patriot was uh, purchased on a grant. Uh, there was a, an airman who was stationed over in the uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire area who donated about $5,000 towards the purchase of him. We we're very lucky to have him. Because, yeah, it was, I think it was yeah, an E6 who really wanted to be a policeman or a dog handler, but yep. he said he's in the Air Force, so he was looking for a, a community in New Hampshire that was really, so it worked out. So you, get, you get to keep your partner. We get a new police canine officer as you get promoted, and you get a new partner. Absolutely. Yeah. It, and it's, it's, the donations are, are huge. Um, I talked about Lieutenant Costa. Uh, canine Nico was actually bought locally by the Elks. Um, and then where we train, uh, Keene's actually a founding member of the Working Dog Foundation. Right now it's out of Portsmouth. Um, it's the, the airman, he donated the money to the Working Dog and we were awarded the grant. Uh, Leica was also a grant dog from the Working Dog Foundation, and, and the biggest part of the grants is to keep uh, the canine service available to the law enforcement agencies around the state. And last week, she spent most of the time in the vet. You also get grant money and some of the city money to help take care of the training and the health care of the vet. Yes. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, so. so what are we going to see today from some of your... Um, uh, you're going to see actually b a little bit from both dogs. You're going to see uh, some obedience. Um, 
we train through the USPCA standards. It's the United States Police Canine Association. Um, they're nationally recognized. Uh, they're a very good organization. Um, and they have a set of standards that you have to go through every year to show that your dog is street ready and patrol ready to work the street. Um, the first and biggest part of that is obedience. Uh, you'll see with the dogs nowadays, and, and, and what's really changed over the years is the demeanor and the attitudes of the dogs. These dogs are very social, they're very friendly, um, which is good for us, especially in a community like Keene, because we can bring them and do demonstrations, we can do community oriented things with the dogs, and they're not alligators and these vicious dogs that you see in the back of the car. They bark, yes, and they sound mean when they're protecting the car, and, but uh, you have to have a dog that's controllable and social. So obedience is the biggest thing. You're going to see that first, and that's the first thing we have to pass every year when we do our testing to show that the dog is in control and we can handle the dog. So you're going to see obedience. Uh, you're going to see some agility here today. Um, you're going to see the bite work routine, which is really just an extension in a in a big obedience session for the dog. Um, we're waving around a big sleeve that's their toy and it, at times we're telling them that they have to leave their toy and if you have a dog of your own you know that's pretty tough to do. So you're going to see um, that and we're also going to show kind of a mix of tracking and uh, evidence search um, with Canine Patriot. You're gonna, it, it's going to simulate being on a track. Obviously it's going to be shortened um, but you're going to show kind of what he looks like while he's tracking and if you find some articles on the way. So, Is there a reason why most of the dogs are German Shepherds? Uh, really because of their versatility. Um, another new and popular breed for patrol work and drug work is the um, Belgian Malinois. And uh, that's really, it's kind of a hyper German Shepherd. It's a sh shorter hair. It's, it's kind of the same build. Um, but they're used really because they have a, a, a ton of energy, they don't tire, uh, they're a good working dog, um, and that's why the, the German Shepherds are used, especially for patrol work, is because they're so versatile in their scent work and in their working capabilities with agility and, and tracking and stuff. But you, you really sometimes want a dog that's going to be intimidating enough to keep people from doing something stupid. You'll see through the bite work that even though like is only about 70 pounds, um, I wouldn't want to be on the other end of her. Um, and when you see the bite work, really that's, that's the least of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I would say 99% of our work is scent work, whether it be tracking or building searches. Um, the bite work is easy to show. It's kind of fun to see. Um, it is very important that they're in control and, and able to do that, but Really, if the dogs had hands like you or I, when they found the person, they would just hold them down until we were able to arrest them. That's, that's really their only way of, of detaining someone until we can help them out and, and place somebody under arrest. You talked about the commitment, how the dog in a lot of times is more, with you more than your wife. Mm -hmm. So what made you two decide that you want to work with dogs? Because it's going to take more commitment than the average police officer. It, 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 I can speak for myself. It does take a lot of commitment. Um, there's a lot of donated there's a lot of time away from home, um, but really, and I think Josh is experiencing the same thing now, it's really the best job in the department. It's very uh, rewarding, there's something new every day, um, and, and when you find someone, whether it be on a, a criminal track or a missing person, there's nothing more rewarding than... Yeah, if you're a five, five-year-old kid lost in the woods right. in the winter, you find them, save their lives. Exactly, right. exactly. It's very rewarding. and. Uh, and just the, the bond you have with the dogs, I mean, they're with us all night long. They, when we're out driving around by ourselves, we, we end up talking to them and petting them, and they end up in the front seat with us and everything else. So it, it, it's really a rewarding job, and I, I'm sure Josh Absolutely. can. Absolutely. It's nice to have a partner with you all the time. Um, it has been very rewarding. In the brief time that I've had Patriot, learned a lot about each other, and we're looking forward to working more together. So since Patriot's a new dog and you're a fairly new police officer, so how long could you think of you and Patriot working together in the future? I suspect probably five years. I've actually been on for about eight now, wow. so <laughs> <laughs> I've been around a little while, but not terribly long either. So. It's, um, 
So that's the average it usually work five, five, seven. Yeah, I, I would say it, de- it really depends on the dog's health. Um, you know, once the dogs get around eight years old, you really start seeing changes in them. Um, they're in their prime. They're in their prime at that point. But I would say between eight and maybe ten years old, when the dogs are that old, that it's time that you can. It's time to start thinking about you know the future and and what you're going to do next. So it, it really depends on <clears throat> excuse me the dog's health and and their performance and their job. Well, I apologize for calling young officer, but I've seen you at the Y, so you're staying in shape, so it makes <laughs> you're keeping your youth. Well, thank you. You're welcome. So now we're going to look at what see some um, video, make some video of the dogs. Yep. Yeah. What, what you're going to see from Josh and Patriot is their obedience routine. Um, this is part of the first part of our testing. You can see that Josh has his uh, Patriot's toy out. One myth is that these dogs are, are trained hard and, and corrected a lot, uh, which is completely opposite. Uh, the dogs are all trained on positive reward. And they never go into the car thinking that they did something wrong. So even if there's an, a mistake or an error, error, we'll we'll go back and we'll we'll do something a little easier so they get rewarded and they get to carry their Kong into the into the car. So what we'll do is we'll show some healing and then um, some change of positions. Let's go ahead and heal. Right, left turn. Right turn. Stop. And you'll hear Officer English. He's using uh, both Canine Patriot and Leica are are bilingual. Uh, most of their obedience is in German. Um, what we'll do now is just go to the in your lead, Josh. Put him in the down. The sit by hand. You can see the Patriot's really ready for his toy. Put him in a heel, and that's a perfect heel. Uh, the dog's attentive to the handler. Uh, he's by his non-weapon side and he's ready for the next command which would probably be a toy since he did such a good job. You gotta think of Patriot as being in kindergarten. Uh, he's just starting out. Um, we train every week with the dogs um, both at work and at the Working Dog Foundation. We go once a week there and we do formalized training there where we practice all the disciplines of, of the patrol work. So you can see he's pretty happy to have his reward. And we'll uh, set up some agility. Good boy, buddy. <clears throat> and like I said, I'll go grab Leica. Um, obedience is, is the biggest part of what we do. We use it in every discipline of patrol work. You'll see it during the agility. You'll see it um, during the bite work. And even in building searches, we have to have control of the dog and call him back to a heel. Um, or if they indicate on a door or in a spot in a building, we need to be able to have control of them and call him back. So obedience is the biggest part of, of the, the police dog and, and the work we do. Uh, and I'll go grab canine Leica now. So what we're going to do now is some of the um, agility uh, this is a test for the dogs. It shows that they can work in various environments on the street. Uh, everything you see out here simulates something we may encounter on the street, whether it be crawling through a culvert, hopping over a fence, uh, through a window, or over a catwalk. That can simulate a, a, a bunch of different things, whether it be a fire escape or, um, or anything we may encounter. So we'll do some agility, or agility with canine Leica and... Uh, and we'll move on to the next thing. Hey, Poos. Poos. 
Platz. Platz. Hey, crawl. Crawl. I like it, crawl. <clears throat> oh, good girl, Foos. Yeah. Foos. Good girl, oh, Foos. Yeah. Foos. Foos. Sit. Up. Oh, good girl, Foos. Yeah. Oh. Good girl, Foos. Oh, good girl, Foos. <clears throat> oh, good. Foos. Foos. Now, when we do the catwalk, these are especially tough for the dogs because it's an open ladder here. Wait, sit. Uh, and the dogs don't see three-dimensional like humans do. They only see two-dimensional. So this is tough because they see through the back side of it. They think they're going to fall through it. Um, and then when they get up top, it's very unsteady and it's very narrow. And, it, and it's a tough feat for the dog to learn this and get to, get to do it. So climb. Climb. Good girl. Climb. Climb. Good. Good. Plots. Plots. Good girl. So we usually leave them up there. We let them relax for a second. Let them get used to the surroundings. Foos. Good girl. Free time. Free. Free time. Oh, good girl. Free time. Oh, yeah, here. Oh. And once again, they get their reward. This is what they work for, is this rubber ball. This is, these dogs will pretty much do anything for us for these balls in their reward. She'll play tug. She'll chase after it. Um, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. And then she get, she'll get to carry it to the car. Uh, she wins. It's her reward. It's her toy. She'll get to carry it to the car and bring her reward back to her house with her. So it's a quick agility. Um, so I noticed that one's a male, one's a female. It makes no difference? It doesn't make a difference. It, it really um, it depends on really how they test. We, when we first look at the dogs, uh, we test them uh, for various things. We test them, test them for social um, around people. Uh, another social thing we test them for is various environments. Um, dogs have a very hard time with sl slippery, shiny floors. Um, they have trouble on fire escapes and graded surfaces where they can see through. Uh, so we test them in, in those areas. And then we do some very simple tests with the ball um, to show their drives. Um, a dog that'll go out and has a high retrieve drive is very good because it shows that they like to work and they like to um, have the reward of their toy. Also what we'll do is we'll take the same ball and we'll throw it into a high wooded area, a high grass area, and we'll wait a little while and then let them go to find it. And that shows their hunt drive and, or their prey drive, the, um, their hunt drive, to see how long they'll work to find their ball and, and find their reward. A dog that stays right with you and, and is waiting for you to throw a new ball probably won't work out because they don't have the drives to work on their own and, and do their own um, work. So all the, all the dogs have their own personality, own fear level, courage level? Oh yes. Yep, they're, you know, they're, I use the reference sometimes, they're, they're just like kids. Um, they have their days where they listen <laughs> They are, in the end, they're still dogs. They still, um, st still have their days. Somet sometimes they're right on, and sometimes you, you think that it's your first day with a dog. But uh, that's why we, we do a lot of repetition, and it's a lot of training, because dogs learn through repetition. Um, 
And so even though Leica and I have been working now for six or seven years, we would do the same stuff that Josh and Patriot do, just to keep that repetition, keep it in her mind of what her work is every day. When I was watching both of you with your dogs, it kind of reminded me of my grandkids. If, if I have something they really want, they're right there in the side of the leg oh, yeah. and everything. Yeah, you're right. They're saying like kids, yep. they're connected to you. And, and they know when they're done working that something good's going to happen. Um, like I said, uh, when Josh was working, the dogs, it's, it's all reward-based. Um, these dogs are, are treated very well. They're, they're very happy in what they do because they know something good's going to happen. Um, if there is correction, like I said, we, we won't end a training session on a, a correction or, or something they did wrong. We'll, if we have to take a step back, we will, and we'll, we'll make sure it's something that they won't fail at. So they go into the car thinking that they're the top dog, they did right, and, uh, and, and everything's good. So, yeah, it is very much like kids. <laughs> you know, you, you wouldn't yell at your kid all the time. You, you, you correct the behavior, and then when they do it right, you reward them. So. Yeah, you don't want to yell or beat the dog in his submission because he's of no value. Right, and then, and really the dog is only working out of fear of the handler, and, the, and that it, you lose your bond. Um, and it, it creates a very adverse working condition for the team. So, and, and it, it turns out to be not very reliable at all. So we're going to get to see some more other, other things with yeah, the dogs. We're, we're going to go over um, articles slash tracking. Um, and it'll simulate somebody that had run off through the woods and maybe discarded some evidence. Um, I'll go over it now because um, it's easier to do it beforehand and talk yep. about it. Um, what the dogs do when they track is, right now as we're all standing here, we're dropping millions and millions and millions of dead skin cells. We all have our own odor. Whether we use the same deodorant, shampoo, or whatever, it doesn't matter. We, we all have our own odor. We all have a DNA. Um, yeah. and, and no matter what we do to try to prevent that, we still are dropping those dead skin cells. So that's what the dogs are looking for when they track. And even when they find articles, um, when we touch something, we leave our oils and skin cells on the article. So the dogs use that to locate the article. And what you'll see, what, how we train our dogs to find articles is when they find it, they'll down on it to indicate that they've found a piece of evidence or an article. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to see now. Um, also, when the dogs are tracking, when we walk on grass, even pavement to a, a sense or in the woods, when we walk, we're breaking the vegetation of the grass or the sticks or the leaves. And that, that breaking of the vegetation leaves a different scent than every other piece of vegetation around it. So that also aids in, in the tracking and helps the dog find the end of the track. So. No different than going and your kid's running through your flower garden and stop breaking it. Right. You and can smell you it. You can smell that. And obviously the dogs have... have a much greater sense of smell than humans do so any little piece of broken vegetation gives off that much more odor coupled with the human scent that we're leaving behind um, and, and that's how they they work a track so, okay so we'll get that set up and ready Come on. so so we're now we're going to do uh, a simulated short track and uh, there's some evidence on this track as well um, and you can see already that Patriot kind of has an idea that he's going to be working. Um, so, and you can hear what, what I didn't cover earlier is sometimes you'll hear we use a higher pitch voice. What that is is we can't always physically reward our dogs, but our voice and, and the tone of our voice can be a reward or a correction to the dog uh, depending on what we need. When we use that high pitch voice, that's, that shows the dog that we're happy. Uh, they're doing a good job, um, and it's an immediate reward for the dog when we can't always physically reward them. So what we're going to do is uh, Josh and Patriot, are, they have a short little track. Uh, there's some, some evidence on this track, and uh, you're going to see that when Patriot finds the, the evidence, he's going to lay down on it, and, and Josh is going to give him that high-pitched voice and probably a little piece of food as a reward that you know he found what he was supposed to. And then at the end of the track, on the last piece of evidence, uh, Patriot will get his ball that he can play with and, and carry to the car. So we're going to start over here, Josh. <laughs> a 
it's a, right on the scuff is where the, yeah. And you can see Patriot's, Patriot's already got his nose to the ground. He's pulling hard and he's down on the first piece of evidence, which ended up being a little knife. Once that's recovered, uh, Josh will set him up to track again. And you can see Patriot's nose is right to the ground. He's working the odor. And you can see when he finds the evidence, he's got a distinct head turn and he lays right down on it and then he's ready to go. Last one. This is your last one. And you can see him working. He's pulling hard on the lead. And he found that last article, which was that glove that was used in the crime scene. So he did a good job. Uh, you, you can see how he worked uh, what we call the scent cone. He didn't always go footstep to footstep. He went left to right. But if he was outside the footsteps, you could see his head snap and see him indicate on that article. And of course, he gets his reward. So, oh, good boy here. And you can see, you're going to see next with the bite work, Josh is going to be my decoy. He's going to be my bad guy. Um, when I was talking about the dogs being social, there's no animosity. I've taken a lot of bites from Canine Patriot, and he doesn't want to eat me right now. He's working. When they do the bite work, they think of it as a game. They think of the bite sleeve as, as their toy or a tug toy, and there's no animosity. Um, Josh can come over to my house with Leica. I can go over to his house with Patriot. If Josh goes out of town and he needs somebody to watch Patriot, any one of us could do that, um, that knows him, and there's no animosity from, from doing bite work or, or any other types of work. So, good boy, Patriot. Yeah, you. And he's a proud dog that gets to carry his toy back to the car. between you and the dog. Is there any trouble or interaction between dogs sometimes? Uh, you know, sometimes there is. Uh, Josh is lucky enough where Patriot is, is very good around other dogs. Um, some dogs are dog aggressive, and that just goes back to different personalities. Um, I have another dog at home. It's, it is manageable, but uh, there are some dogs that aren't good around other dogs. Um, and there's some that it could be all right here together in one big pack and it, it wouldn't be a problem. So it's really just personality and dog, dog specific. But, uh, and that's just the nature of the beast. It's not really anything to do with the work that they do or anything else. So that's probably part of the evaluation, slippery fours and all this other yeah, kind of and, stuff right off and, the bat. And being dog aggressive won't necessarily wash a dog out from being a police dog. That's just something we need to be aware of. Um, you know, especially if we're doing a building search with other animals inside, uh, we usually try to make sure that if we know there's animals inside, we try to get them out, or we're at least aware of it. Um, and that's the same if, if we had a call where we needed two dogs on, like a missing person or something. Um, we have to use multiple dogs on, on missing people where we don't have a starting point, where we can't set up a direct track. And what we'll do is we'll just split the area up in two different areas. We'll, we'll set up grids. So the dogs don't have to be in contact with each other. And by doing that, you, you cover more area in, in less time. So it, it's, it is manageable, but it's, it is something you have to be aware of. So we'll get ready for like everybody likes to see. The, the bite, bite work. The bite work. That's right. <laughs> Good boy. Okay, this is the, the bite portion part of our testing that we go through annually. Um, and you're going to see several disciplines during this. Um, the first one that we do is what we call tolerance. Uh, people need to be able to approach us and, and talk to us and be able to have a conversation with, with us without the dogs going out of control or wanting to bite them. Um, typically when we do this testing we try to make it real life as real life as possible and we wear what we call a hidden sleeve over or under a, a sweatshirt or a long sleeve shirt. So he looks normal and he doesn't have a big brown sleeve hanging off the side of his arm. Um, this actually makes it harder for the dog because they know their toy is there and they want to use, have their toy and get rewarded by their toy. So uh, we'll start with the tolerance. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Hey, how you doing, officer? 
Good. How are you? Good. good. Going? Pretty good. Leave it. I guess you're all set. Uh, thanks for visiting us. Take okay. care. Thank you. Leave it. Right you there can see it's Josh. like a red race house ready to go. Leave it. Now you're going to see um, the same picture, but this time this guy decides he doesn't want to be nice to us. He doesn't want to cooperate, and we'll see how Leica reacts uh, if, he, if we're challenged. Leave it. Leave it. Oh, God, get him. Oh, good girl. So he raised his hand like he was going to assault us. Um, just good. And you'll see, he, now he's ready to give up. I'm here. I'm able to help Leica. So it's very important, especially when we're on the street, that we have a verbal out. Because if, and you can see that she's biting and holding. She's not, she is tugging, but she's not biting him all over the place. She's not on his legs and all over his arms. She's biting and holding him until I can get there. Now, um, I'm here to help Leica, and we'll have a verbal out. And it's important to have the verbal out so we have control over the dog. And so if we're, we don't want to rip and pull the dog off because it'll just cause more damage to our suspects. So stop fighting the dog like foos. And she outs it right off. Right from there, we'll do tolerance. Sit. Leave him. Leave it. And you'll see there's no animosity. Leave it. Leave him. Good, good. Good, nothing. We're all set. Thanks. Okay. Have a good day. And you can see she leaves him alone. And that's hard for the dog to do. Like I said, that's her toy. She loves that thing. Um, so it's, it's a big obedience. It's like having a bunch of candy bars and leaving them out on the living room table and telling your kids they can't touch them. It's basically the same picture for the dog. Uh, now we'll have what we call, it's a recall. Um, go a little bit further out. Nope. Uh, what I'll do is, he's a suspect that we've been looking for. We've now found him. I'm going to challenge him. He's going to decide he doesn't want to give up, so the dog will be released. And then when the dog has been released, he decides he made a bad idea, and he does want to give up. We have to recall the dog. Now, that's even harder than the tolerance, because now we don't have the dog on leash or anything else, and they're expected to come back to us and not not go get their reward. So, sir, come here, you're under arrest. Keen police, Keen police canine, you're under arrest. You're gonna get bit. Get him. Like a nine here! Oh, go girl! Oh, foos. Good girl, oh, that's a good girl. And you can see she came back uh, to me without her getting her reward. Uh, when we do this in training, to help build that, and she's looking for it now, she'll get a reward back to me. So I'm, I'm the funner person to come back to. Um, I'm a lot funner than going and biting him and getting a little bit of satisfaction where if she comes back to me, I'll play with her, we'll play, we'll play catch, we'll toss, I'll pull the Kong, and I make it funner to come back to me than it would be if, if she didn't listen to me and go out and get that sleeve. This time, uh, our bad guy Josh, is not going to give up, so I won't have to recall Leica. And then I'll have to go down and place him under arrest. So what you're going to see is what we call a long send. Uh, you're going to see another verbal out. And then if, in case I'm by myself, you'll see a prisoner search. And Leica will sit there and watch us in case she needs to help me out with another handle or assault. Um, and it's important, you'll see every time I release the dog, and it's the same when we find people at the end of a track. It's not up to us if the dog bites the person. It's really up to them because we give them the same options every time. We tell them that we're the keen police, that they're under arrest, and that um, they need to give up and do so. If they don't, depending on the severity of the crime, then, or if they're assaultive or they're going to hurt somebody else, then we will use the dog to help, them, help us apprehend that person until we can get them placed in handcuffs. So you, you'll hear that every time I release the dog. You're under arrest. It's Keen Police Canine. You're going to get bit. It's your last warning. You're going to get bit. Get him. <clears throat> Good.
Good girl. Oh, good girl. Stand still. Stop fighting the dog. Like an ounce. Boost. Good girl. Oh, good girl. What? Blibe. Now he's given up. I have Leica in a position where she can watch me and help me out if she needs to. It's going to be clean. And I'm going to come search Josh. Blibe. Good girl, Blibe. And now he has no weapons. I can hook Leica back up. Blibe. And we can walk him out of the woods. <coughs> She's good. No. <laughs> good girl. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <sighs> you had talked about the, the strength, the endurance, and agility. How long can they usually run, chase someone down in the woods? Um, like and I have had tracks up to two miles long. Um, and that's tracking, which takes more out of them because, as you saw, it's a lot of work for them. Their nose is to the ground. Um, they're doing a lot of smelling. It's different terrains. We've gone through swamps. We've gone across rivers. Um, so they have to be in pretty good shape, and so do we. So you, you said you saw Josh at the Y. That you know why. Uh, so the, the dogs have to be in very good shape. They have to um, be very dependable in, the, in those circumstances, and. Uh, and help us out. So. so Josh is in really good shape. If he's got a 100 to 200 meter head start, it's still going to be foolish for him to try to outrun the dog. Oh, uh, yeah. I, you know, I haven't seen anybody yet in all the years of training that anybody that's been able to outrun the dog. So It's amazing what kind of ideas that alcohol and drugs will give you. Right. Can well, if, really... if you remember the movie Cool Hand Luke, yes. uh, when, when Swansea had their dog, they actually had somebody try to replicate that with the with the pepper and when I talked about the tracking that that only helped because that was a different odor than anywhere else um, and, and there's been tests that that type of stuff doesn't typically bother the dogs um, we train in different environments um, I use Leica on the SWAT team to help us do building searches in, in high risk tracking where we'll go out with the whole team and in, in formation so that's a that's a whole different set of work in itself because she needs to be a, be around and be used to being around um, the, the different SWAT personnel and, and people wearing helmets and, and bigger vests and and, uh, and in a formation type thing other than a regular track where it's usually just me and, and a backup officer. The um, We don't have much time left but we were talking earlier about the dogs but then you're talking about drug dogs which are a totally different type mm -hmm. of animal. Can you explain the difference? Um, the difference is, is it's still scent work. Um, we still train it very similar to the way we train any of the scent work, whether it be building searches or tracking, in that we'll use um, toys or towels, real tightly rolled up towels, that's scented with the drugs. That's, that's how you imprint the dogs with that. Is, and it's very, you have to be very sterile in that you'll wear gloves so you're not getting, not getting human odor on it. Um, It'll be very drug specific. So if I had a towel in a marijuana bin scenting with marijuana, I wouldn't use that for cocaine or heroin. Because um, you, you need to proof the dogs off every, with drugs, you need to proof them off everything that else is used in the drug world. Rubber gloves, um, masking tape. Uh, they'll set up hides where there's food in a box and drugs in this box. They can't touch the food. You, you proof them off everything so they know that when they find what they've been trained to with that reward, they're going to get their reward. Um, so it's just another, another aspect of scent work, and it's, just, it's more specialized. And what about um, explosives and cadaver dogs? It's the same thing. Um, it, it's really, it, the, the only problem is if when you, as you add those dents, the theory is, is I can be a really good baseball player and a really good football player, but if I, if I stayed with just football and practiced football year-round, then um, I'm going to be a much better football player. It, it's, the same, it's the same with the dogs. The more disciplines you add, whether it be 
patrol, drugs, explosives, cadaver, the more you're going to take away from those other areas. They may be good in all those areas, but, but, to be, but not excellent. Um, so there are many cross-trained dogs. It works very well. Um, and, and actually, Josh and Patriot will probably be cross-trained um, once they're imprinted with the patrol work. So that makes them very good and to excellent patrol dogs in a patrol dog team. And then they'll work on, on the drugs to be a good drug team and, and work on that. So it, it's all just imprinting of the different odors. You can, they're using dogs now to find cancer. Um, I actually just read an article. They're using dogs to find bed bugs in hotels in, in <laughs> New York. <laughs> it, it's it, whatever you need the dog to do. It's just a matter of imprinting that scent into them and letting them know that they're going to get the reward because they find that scent. So we had talked earlier about <clears throat> the dogs having a lot of the same protections of being a police officer. Yep. So if you have a criminal or a suspect, they go to court. The dog has to be able to present its certifications to the court, just like the police officer. Does. That's correct, and um, and that's why we we show we have to have we actually just upped it. The USPCA is a minimum of 16 and a half hours of formal, formalized training every month, um, and then the yearly certifications. Beyond that, there's there's greater certifications in patrol work and in tracking. Um, that we've also done. They, it's what they call PD-1s, which is a, it's a, another uh, patrol certification that's based on a score system. And they have what they call PD-2s, which is a tracking certification, um, which is a longer track. It's, it's aged longer. There's evidence on the track that needs to be recovered. And you need to do all those things to, to pass it. Whereas uh, the yearly certifications is a basic certification um, similar to what we go through when we go through the police academy in our annual trainings. Um, there's always better training out there, and we try to hold our dogs to that. So if, if the time comes we ever have to go to court, we can show that we're doing all we can to, to put out a good product and, and put out a good working dog team. So the minimum requirements would be able to track on a nice day like today. Yep. But then if you had a storm come in, and it's been for two days, yeah, um, that's the top notch to be able to track? Yeah, uh, the, the basic track is, uh, is three legs. It's, uh, I, I don't remember the exact length now, but it's, it's usually about at least 500 yards long. And uh, there's three types of terrain. It's usually on a grass and then woods, and there's probably usually a road crossing. Um, the PD-2 is, can be up to a mile or longer. There's the evidence you have to recover and find and indicate on that the dog has to show. Um, it's older and it's different in harder terrains than, than regular grass and woods, which is easy because it's so porous and because you can break up the vegetation. So. And so we were talking about the patrol dogs. They're more the German Shepherd, the, the Belgium mix. Yeah. Bomb dogs, um, drug dogs. They're not always German Shepherd. There seems to be all different types of breeds. There, there can be. That, that's really um, where the testing comes in, just on their prey drive and their hunt drive. Um, Labradors, Golden Retrievers, um, Shepherds, Malinois. It, I've actually traveled to El Salvador to help them train some of their dogs, and they were using a Brittany Spaniel. Um, it, it really depends on their drives and, and the testing of the dogs for when you specialize in that type of scent work. And changing the subject, what happens to the dog when you gentlemen go on vacation? Um, I, we've boarded them. Uh, you've boarded your dog. I've boarded Leica. Um, a lot of times my sister, my, my family is okay around her. She's okay around them. Uh, they'll come over and take care of her. Um, so we have some options, but it's it's, we usually take the same precautions that we would if we were leaving our kids and we were going away for the weekend. So, so if either one of you is on vacation, your dog doesn't work. You have to get a replacement team from someplace else. Yeah, if if there was a dog needed, um, we would call either the state police or another dog from the Working Dog Foundation. Um, you know, and, and we train with them, and, and we know that you know the caliber of training that that both agencies use. So. And so 
I want to thank both Officer Tenney, Sergeant Tenney, and congratulations on your um, thank promotion you. and new addition to your family. Thank you. Um, a patrolman, is it patrolman or Officer, Officer English? English? Officer English in there. And again, I want to thank you, and I want to thank both of your partners for being out here. Well, thank you for and having I us. I think it's my pleasure, and I think the people of Keene will in enjoy this. I hope so. I think so. a lot will learn what you do. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Good girl. You ready? Oh, free time. So I hope everyone enjoyed the, um, the filming of both Keene police dogs and <clears throat> come to the understanding that there is police dogs are trained for different um, specialities. Some are better than others. Um, some will be drug dogs. Some will be um, <clears throat> bomb sniffing dogs. Some will be cadaver dogs. Again, like um, the two police officers, Sergeant Tenney had stated was you can't over train the dog because as you train uh, more um, disciplines, the ability of the dog to perform at a high level drops off. <clears throat> and so I think, as I said earlier, this will be a welcome addition. And um, again, both of these police officers will be out in the public, and I'm pretty sure the people will get to see the dogs. Now we're going to transition to a little, a tough one. Um, Staff Sergeant Reed, whose goal is to come back to the United States and be um, a police officer. Well, he could run into one of these little um, problems. <clears throat> more and more of um, our young men and women who are coming back from tours in Afghanistan, Iraq, some with multiple tours, are coming back and they're being diagnosed with PTSD. And for some, some it's really serious PTSD and they need to be treated and they need to get as much help as they can to return them to be productive members of society. Other um, soldiers, 22, 23 years old, they'll come back and they'll get a, a rating of maybe 10 or 20 percent of PTSD and 10, 20 percent of PTSD may give them 130 to 250 dollars. They could get that for the rest of their lives. But by getting rated as PTSD, it could have a negative effect on the rest of their lives. It has a negative effect on their possibilities and their future. Because one of the problems you have, PTSD can be permanent and you can then get the proper treatment to to increase your functionality, but also PTSD <clears throat> can be temporary. With the right coping skills, you're right back in and you can um, function at, a, at 100%. But the problem is when you get a PTSD and you get a low, like I said, 10 or 20% rating of PTSD, you may eliminate your possibility of ever becoming a police officer, a fireman, or an EMT. Because there's a question, if someone has PTSD, are they stabled or are they unstabled? And um, it's like any trauma. A lot of people suffer trauma. They can have temporary PTSD. They learn to recover from it and they go on and <clears throat> have highly functional lives and raise families, don't go through divorce. They don't go through domestic um, abuse again. But so what I would say with our young men and women who are coming back from the, the military, be careful. If you need help, seek help. But don't go and take an easy rating of 10 or 20% for a few hundred bucks a month because it could have a definite negative effect on what you can do in the future. The other place with PTSD, you really have to be careful. And let me tell you, I'm not an expert in PTSD. Um, <clears throat> we've had, I know people who have had PTSD. I know people who have suffered really seriously from PTSD up to a point that they can't function <clears throat> whatsoever in a day-to-day -day life. And in a lot of ways, that their lives are really destroyed as the way they meant. But for others, you really have to be careful, again, not rep repeating the careful, because in some places, PTSD, if your PTSD is high enough, you may not be able to own a weapon. So if you're an avid hunter, you have to be careful 
then you have to realize this could have a negative effect on you. Some places, PTSD is viewed as a mental illness. It goes to your competency. Someone can go and say, hey, this individual is not competent enough to handle their, their finances. This person may not be competent enough to vote. So again, I'm not a medical doctor, but what I'm saying is when you come back, you have problems, seek out proper medical and psychological help, be evaluated, <clears throat> ask a lot of questions, but do not readily accept a PTSD rating if it's being forced upon you. Think about it. Again, ask questions and say, how can I develop coping skills to overcome this and go on? You've got to be careful. You don't make a decision at age 23 or 24. That will, have, will affect the rest of your life. And so, <clears throat> again, bingo, just be careful. You've done a lot. You've gone through a lot. And you survived combat, you survived, you maybe survived some na nasty injuries. So just be careful, evaluate, ask questions, and you make a proper decision based on as much information as possible. Well, thank you for being with me today. I appreciate it, and I'll see you on that long road in the future. Refreshments provided by G. Housen Distributors. Premium beverages delivered.